next on this week's edition of Heartland Highways, we're headed to Crawfordsville, Indiana. First, we'll visit the Rockkey Armor Museum for a look at tanks, boats, and more military memorabilia, each with their own special history. Then we'll stop in at the Rotary Jail Museum, the only museum of its kind with a cell block that still spins. We'll also take a look at some other sights and sounds of Crawfordsville. Those adventures are just ahead, so don't go away. Welcome back to Heartland Highways. I'm Kate Pleasant. And I'm Lori Casey. And this first story was the suggestion of one of our viewers, so we wanted to check it out for ourselves. This week, we're taking you to Crawfordsville, Indiana. Now, while we were there, we discovered several art galleries, historic sites, and museums, which is why Crawfordsville has been called the Athens of the Midwest. Today, we'll take you on a tour of two unique museums. First, just outside of town, we found a 50-acre site known as the Robke Armor Museum. Located here since 2004, the museum is the lifelong collection of Fred Rocky, and it includes everything from armored vehicles, tanks, a helicopter, boats, and more. When I was eight, my grandfather gave me my great-grandfather's Civil War pistol. So that started me off. That same year, my dad brought me a War of 1812 sword. And that same year, now that I was primed, I went out and found my first sword. I still have those, plus a lot more. And that's no exaggeration. Take one look around the Robke Armor Museum and it's apparent that Fred has amassed an impressive and historic collection of armored vehicles. I bought my first armored car when I was in high school. I graduated from high school in 1948 and I think I bought this 47. It's right back over here. And I used to drive that to school on occasions and that was uh, always a lot of fun. Um, girls like going out in armored cars. In the earlier days of collecting, particularly of armor, which is, is a pretty elite type collecting, not everybody wants or can afford what we have here. But the people that can are very, it's a close-knit organization internationally. We know people all over the world and they know us. But um, it's just one of those things that kind of gets out of control. The collection includes tanks from World War I up to the present time, armored support vehicles, a patrol boat, helicopter, motorcycles, a current issue marine assault boat, plus hundreds of artifacts, photos, and memorabilia. One of the most common questions that Fred has asked, where'd you get all this stuff? The answer, all over the world. The tanks are all U.S. made, but at some point in history, they were sold to other countries. Um, just to give you an example, if the, a lot of ours were used during World War II by various countries, and uh, people are surprised when I tell them that two of my tanks came from Brazil, South America. And uh, by the way, I get Brazilians in here, you know, and they're interested when they see that. Um, and it's because we furnished equipment to these countries um, to train with. We did the same thing with Canada. Um, so we sent these vehicles down there, the government bought them, those governments bought them, and then at some time later on they were scrapped, and when, that's when we grabbed them and so forth. Fred comes from a long line of proud military service on both sides of his family. He served as a tank platoon leader in the Marines from 1949 to 1955, including the Korean War. His time in the military furthered his collecting interests. By 1982, he decided to turn his private collection into a museum with a mission to preserve and share military history. In 2004, he moved the museum from just outside of Indianapolis to rural Montgomery County, not far from Crawfordsville. It's, it was truly divine guidance that I think brought us here. And uh, we love the people in this area. We love that the people in Crawfordsville have done so much to be uh, to make us feel at home. A majority of vehicles are housed under a new heated and air-conditioned building. One thing that makes Fred's collection unique, 
all of the tanks and vehicles are fully operational. What we do here is make our stuff run. It doesn't take as much brains or effort to just paint it up pretty and set it and drag it around. Besides, you get a double hernia real fast trying to move a tank. So we like them to go under their own power. In addition to making them operational, each piece is carefully researched and restored. Skip Warville is the museum's restoration expert and curator. The process is documented through photographs, which are displayed throughout the museum. Well, this little tank right here is, is known as the six-ton U.S.-made, the first, first American-made tank. It was originally called a six-ton, a special six-ton tractor. It really isn't six tons, it weighs seven and a half. Don't ask me where they got the six tons. There's only two of these in operational condition. One's in Missoula, Montana, and there's this one. This is the finest one in existence. It drives, it does everything it's supposed to do. It was such terrible shape that people didn't think it could be saved. Um, but the impossible we do right away. I mean, <laughs> difficult we do right away the possible takes it a little longer. And this was six years. And luckily we had, I had an original manual and that meant everything, World War I manual, yeah. What's really interesting about this is when you get into all the little um, interesting things that they, they were not using radios, they were testing with radios in the First World War but they weren't successful. So they each tank carried two carrier pigeons and your audience can't see it, right behind this tank is a hutch with two carrier pigeons, uh, with stuffed carrier pigeons. They've not been waiting to get out all this time. <laughs> but, um, and so when they were the tanks, let's say with Patton in charge or whoever was on the line of departure, ready to move out and smoke and couldn't see anything, they released a carrier pigeon and hopefully it would get back before German, some German saw it and shot it down because that happened all the time. But it's, uh, it's that little interesting things that you find out about this stuff that makes it more than just a big piece of metal. It makes it, uh, it's, it's part of history. One piece in the collection that's still a bit of a mystery is the yellow submarine. Uh, we're still determining exactly where that came from. It's old. Uh, we know that it came from Lafayette, Indiana, where for years it sat in front of the, uh, along the levee, along the Wabash River. But um, it, kids would climb on it and stick beer cans in it and everything, opening, they'd try to get something, they'd scratch their names on. And the, uh, the city decided it was a liability, and so they sent it to Winsky's big scrapyard up in Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, there, luckily, there was nice folks that owned that place. It didn't scrap it. They, it sat there, and it took me about five years to negotiate a deal out with them. But they are wonderful people, and they saved it. And so we're researching it. But it's a two-man submarine. It's a real submarine, though, and it's old. We thought originally it may have been used in the Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But we haven't seen it in that. But it was something. But that's part of the mystery. Because the collection is operational and the fact that Fred can actually operate these huge machines, Hollywood has called upon him to supply tanks for movies and television. His credits include the Blues Brothers, Tank, and ER. I was on Daily Plaza during the Blues Brothers chase scene and we chased, we tore up more stuff, but most of it wound up on the cutting room floor. There was so much carnage in that, of vehicles getting turned. We had a wonderful time, worked right with the Belushi and uh, Dan Aykroyd and, and, um, and we had armored cars driving through downtown Chicago. It was, it, there's whole, that's a whole nother story. And speaking of stories, Fred feels his collection is more than just supersized pieces of machinery and aircraft. Each piece has an important story to tell of its mission and the people who operated it. This Vietnam-era helicopter is a good example. It served three tours of duty when we checked the serial numbers with the 114th in Vietnam. And we took that to, to uh, Louisville, Kentucky for the, uh, 
reunion several years ago and a lot of the surviving pilots and gunners and family members signed the inside of that, which is again, it's a very emotional thing, but some of those are signed by killed in action family members. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a helmet in that that belonged to the door gunner who was shot through the face, shot right through the helmet here, came out this side. He survived and he's been here and he was with us down in Louisville and he donated his helmet, which is in there, the original helmet that he was shot through. And again, that becomes very emotional, very personal, but it's, it helps people uh, release things and talk about them. It's hard for me. What started with his grandfather's Civil War pistol at age eight Today, Fred Rothke's Army Museum is a place that keeps military history and heroism alive for all who come here. This is a lot of work, a lot of money, uh -huh. but it's what I believe in. You know, you only go around once, so you might as well be doing something worthwhile. And I've done a lot of things. You know, I was a salvage diver at one time. I served in the Marine Corps as a tank officer. Uh, but I, I, I've done a lot of neat things, and but we believe it's important to share with the veterans and the veterans' families. Since we were spending the day in Crawfordsville, we made our next stop at the Rotary Jail Museum in the downtown area. The historic jail built in the late 1800s was the very first of its kind built in the United States and is still one of the few of its kind that are still standing. I guess the best way to explain what a rotary jail is would be to think of a pie in which the pieces are jail cells and the whole thing turns, kind of like a lazy Susan. The jail is very unique and some of the stories that go with it are even more so. So sit back and enjoy as we take a spin with the Rotary Jail Museum in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Crawfordsville, Indiana is widely known for its museums and art galleries. And this particular museum near downtown is bound to turn some heads. The jail was originally built in 1881-1882. It was the first Rotary Jail that was constructed in the United States. And so they were really taking a huge risk because this had never been tried before. It was a radical new concept. And it was based on the idea of railroad technology in terms of having a turntable and then that you have a jail that is built on a turntable. The design is unique and less than 20 jails of this kind were built, let alone survive today. And the Montgomery County Rotary Jail is even more unique as it has one feature that none of the other rotary jails that are still standing have. It's the only one whose cell block still turns. Think about a turntable, or sometimes it's easier to conceive of a, a lazy Susan, and you have a pie on a lazy Susan. You take the pie, you cut it into eight pieces, and each of those eight pieces is an individual jail cell. The basic idea was that you would only have one opening, so people could only have access to go in and out of one of those pieces of pie or one of those cells at any one time. So um, you would turn the pie then to whichever cell you wanted to get. And so that was the basic idea behind it. We were the only two story that was ever built, which means that basically you have um, two sets of cells that are stacked on top of each other, but it's all connected as one mechanism. So when we turn it, we're turning the entire mechanism. The weight of the mechanism is estimated to be between 15 and 30 tons. And as tour coordinator Rachel Kolchek demonstrates, that's a lot of weight to move manually. So. Well, once you get the momentum going, it's not too bad, but... So by now, you may be wondering, why build a rotary-style jail? There were a number of reasons. One was in terms of the security of the sheriff and his staff. Um, it was easy to not have as many people here. Um, you know, the county wouldn't have to pay as many staff people because you could only let people go in and out of one cell at a time. 
So that was seen as a reduced staffing issue. Also in terms of safety, you didn't have to worry when you were letting people in and out of one cell about people escaping from the other seven um, on that level because um, there was only one way in or out, literally. And so that was one of, the, one of the main advantages. It was also seen as an advance in the humane treatment of prisoners at that time. Um, prisoners in the cells had access to light, they had access to fresh air, there were windows that opened back then. And so that was a, a huge advance in terms of many of the ways that prisoners were treated at that time. And perhaps an expert in prisoner treatment in the jail is Elizabeth Scholl, the jail's last matron before it closed in the 1970s. As the sheriff's wife, it was her job to cook for the prisoners and take care of any women or children that were brought in. Not only did she work at the jail, she lived in the connected residence too. Well, we moved into the jail uh, and my husband became officially the sheriff, August 1st, 1969. And I was the matron, which meant I was sworn in as a deputy sheriff. And I took care of all the food for the prisoners. I took care of any uh, females that were arrested, or if a law enforcement officer had to go pick one up, they usually picked got me here at the jail and then we went out and picked up the female and also any juvenile boys 14 or younger were in my care. It's safe to say that the Shell's living situation was unique but Elizabeth says it was more normal than one might think and her four daughters even learned some lessons too. They will tell you if you talk with one of them it was their favorite place to live. They loved living here. And they learned some lessons living here. Um, I'll give you one for instance, was uh, one of my daughters was unhappy with me because she wanted to do something and I said no. So she was sitting on the back step outside the back door pouting. And one of the prisoners said, hey little shawl girl, who are you angry at today? And she said, well, my mother will not let me do something I want to do, so I'm kind of pouting about my mother. And he said, well, let me tell you that you need to listen to what your mom and dad say, or you may end up like me. So they did learn a few lessons. Well, lots of people thought it was scary and it was not. The girls knew right away that everyone here was locked up and that there was a turnkey here every second of every day and night and that they didn't have anything to worry about. So it really wasn't scary. We felt very safe. Also, as we learned later, that turnkey would give his life for any of us. So. It was a good, secure feeling. The jail transitioned almost directly to a museum just after it closed in the 1970s. But to get to that point took a lot of community support. For example, the jail had been fixed in place for a long time, and to get it spinning again took a lot of time and elbow grease. And of course, the original crank, which was missing. Hey crank that was used to actually turn the jail, um, you know, that had been disabled in the 1930s in, because they, for security reasons basically. Um, it, they had had a number of injuries at that point and they needed to fix the jail in place. And so there was a local resident who had the hand crank and so, um, you know, he, he brought it back and, and turned it in one day um, in case we needed it and of course it was needed. Um, there were a number of people, a local businesses, who contributed labor to get the facility working again and get the jail actually rotating. I mean, we're the only one that still rotates, and that was because of the efforts of a lot of local business people in terms of donating free labor, as well as an engineering company in town who has worked to help maintain it for us. A full tour of the jail museum provides a comprehensive glimpse into what life was like for prisoners of a rotary jail and the sheriff's family that lived there too. 
Um, they get a tour of the residence so they can see the first floor of the residence. We were the um, first museum in the area and so when people were cleaning out, you know, parents, grandparents, attics, basements, um, they donated items here and so we have a lot of items from local residents that they've donated over the years. So um, we have furniture, art, we have a lot of clothing and hats on display. Women took very good care of their clothing back then, especially their fancy dresses and hats. So we have a lot of those on display. Um, we also have items from when the jail was actually being used as a jail in a collection. They also can take a tour of the jail and the tour takes them from the top to bottom so they can see the first and the second floors and the individual cells. They can also see the third floor which was originally intended to be the infirmary. They can see the basement and see the underneath of the turntable and how the mechanism actually works. So they can see quite a bit when they come here. Since Crawfordsville is known as the Athens of the Midwest, there are plenty of other sites to see while you're in town too. A few of the side trips we took included the Carnegie Museum of Montgomery County, the General Lou Wallace Study and Museum, and Lane Place. The Carnegie Museum of Montgomery County is housed in Indiana's first Carnegie Library building. Opened in 1902, the building served as Crawfordsville's public library until 2005 when the library moved across the street. Owned and operated by the Crawfordsville District Public Library, the Carnegie Museum is an interactive museum of history, science, and art. The two-story building features six galleries with various themes and rotating exhibitions. Next, we stopped at what is called Lane Place. The Henry S. Lane Antebellum Mansion and surrounding five acres serves as a village common in the center of Crawfordsville. Known as Lane Place, the site has hosted political rallies, civic events, and annual festivals in addition to serving as the summer home of Montgomery County Civic Band. The site has Abraham Lincoln connections and overlooks Pattison Pavilion and the Speed Cabin, a part of Indiana's Underground Railroad heritage that is restored and available for tours. Our final stop during our time in Crawfordsville was to the General Lew Wallace Study and Museum. The museum is the site where general, diplomat, inventor, and world-renowned author of Ben-Hur, Lew Wallace used as his personal study. The museum houses personal artifacts from Wallace as well as his artwork, violins, inventions, and library. There's also a display with memorabilia from various adaptations of Ben-Hur including the 1959 Oscar-winning version starring Charlton Heston. The museum's three-plus acres provide an inviting place to sit and enjoy the peaceful setting or host an event with friends. There are many other museums and stops that could be made in Crawfordsville. We just recommend calling or going online first to make sure your stop of choice is open. If you'd like to purchase a copy of any Heartland Highways program, contact us at 1-877-727-9348 during regular business hours. You can also visit our online store at weiu.net or mail your order with payment to the address on your screen. DVDs are available for $25 each. Just let us know what show you're interested in by mentioning the story name or the person featured in the show. As we close today, we have a little extra video to show you. If you're wanting to see how easy it was to rotate the jail, Lori here decided she would try it for herself. So take a look at that. So I'm going to actually turn the jail that at one time held a lot of prisoners. And I'm going to rotate the whole thing. And it's a little harder than it, work, than it looks. <laughs> this is Lori moving several tons of steel. Go, Lori. Yeah. Oh, I didn't get any momentum going. Here we go. Now, if there are people in here, it would be a lot harder. Here, I'll show you what she's doing. I'll go around the corner here. Okay, now we gotta go. There, there it goes. See, there goes the, the cell spinning as Lori's turning. That's it. It's a workout. There you go. Imagine doing this with how many prisoners? Okay. 32. <laughs> I lost so much. Get it going again. Alright. Good job. So yeah, they could do this and with up to 32 prisoners inside. So thanks for showing us how the rotary jail works, Lori. Yeah, I need to I need a drink of water now. <laughs>
Kate, that was not as easy as I made it <laughs> well, look. Well, I mean, it is a lot of steel to turn all by yourself. <laughs> it is. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for coming along with us to Crawfordsville, Indiana. If you're in that part of the state, be sure to stop in and check out the town. There's a lot to offer. We'll see you next time. Now you can watch Heartland Highways online anytime. Check us out on youtube.com slash WEIUTV. Once you're there, just look for the Heartland Highways playlist, which will take you to a list of full episodes from season 7 through 11. And if you subscribe to our channel, you'll automatically be notified of when new programs are available to view. Do it by oh. yourself. Do it by yourself. Do it alone. Good luck, chump. I probably slouched. I get going and it's like I sink. Good. I know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Oops. Okay, that was less sucky than the first one. Yeah. You know, what are you laughing about? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> really? I thought it was good. Okay. It was all script, and she saved it. She saved it. I save everything. A little bit of humor. A little humor. A little no, natural ability. Like, okay, so we're going. Several art. Several. Several art galleries. I thought you were going to go on. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. There's bugs in here. Yeah, I see that. A, there's totally a bug. Okay. Um, so you want me to go? Yeah, let's just try every other set okay. and see how it goes.